Hello and welcome. You are tuning into KGOB Goblin Radio for our Midnight UFO Story Hour. I'm your host, Goblin Queen, and the next 60 minutes will be filled with tales of bizarre creatures, extraterrestrial visitations, mysterious figures, strange lights in the sky, and they're all true. These encounters are from the Northern UFO Newsletters, or NUFON, a British publication edited by the great ufologist Jenny Randalls, and were all published in the 1980s. If you're ready to experience all the universe has to offer, sit back, relax, light a candle, and enjoy. February 16th, 1980. 1 a.m., Edinburgh, Scotland. The witness is married with two children and aged 39 at the time of incident. He's employed as a bus driver. About six months before these events, he was troubled by a voice inside his head, calling his name. He saw his general practitioner and went for a short course of treatment, but voluntarily stopped this before the incident, as he felt it was doing no good. The voices continued. On February 15th, he had had several drinks in a pub, then returned to a friend's house for more drinks. He was finally driven home by the father of his friend. After being dropped off outside his apartment, he first went inside, then, for a reason he cannot explain, returned outside again. In an open space beside the building, he claims to have seen a light, like the moon, shining on the ground, and upon looking up, saw a dark oval shape, the apparent size of a dinner plate at arm's length, silhouetted against the sky. At this point, he claims to have become engulfed in a light tube, which surrounded him and left him unable to move. He felt numb, but calm and warm, and could smell what seemed to be strong burning matches. He now saw three figures emerge from the light at ground level. One approached and signaled to the others with a gesture to stay back. They were human-like, five and a half feet in height, average build, wearing a one-piece suit of dark metallic silver. The face was covered by a brown visor, which had a round attachment, but no tubing. Under each shoulder was a bulge. The hands were covered by material that was darker than the remainder of the suit. The alien spoke in a voice like mixed foreign tongues, but after a while, he could understand, and they communicated in the mind. It gave him a message to pass on. This was our planet before you, and we will not allow you to destroy it. If you try, we will send a warning and will shudder the earth. Only the innocent will survive. The figure vanished, leaving the witness weak and dizzy. He returned home and called the police, who believed the witness to be drunk. The witness himself terminated the investigation, but the conclusion seems self-evident. There's some common themes and occurrences in this story that occur in UFO sightings, such as the clothing they were wearing, a one-piece suit of metallic silver. This is very common. Also, that a message of sort of a ecological warning and encouragement of the preservation of Earth. Although this entity seems to be kind of intimidating and even issues some direct threats. I thought it was interesting that the aliens communicated with the witness telepathically or in the mind, and months before these events transpired, he was troubled by voices inside his head. I wonder if these were also telepathic communications from aliens, or was this encounter an event of mental illness? It's hard to say. That's all the details they have since, like they said, the witness terminated the investigation. Next story. July 22nd, 1982, 11 p.m., Greater Manchester. This was a hot night, and three women, whose husbands were working the night shift, decided to sit on the pavement in some chairs, chatting away. Opposite them were some flats, and to their right, a line of garages, and beyond that, a piece of wasteland. After about two hours outside of chatting, Mrs. M noticed a bright star over the flats. As it passed midnight, the star began to move from the west to the north and elongated. It took on the appearance of a spinning top and became reddish. At 1.15 a.m., it curved away over Winter Hill. At 2 a.m., the Jack Russell dog that was with them began to whine and darted off into the house. At that point, the three women heard a noise that Mrs. M says, We never want to hear again in all our lives. It was like a sucking 
croaking and was repeated four times. Suddenly, with a huge sucking sound, this terrifying figure appeared on the wasteland. After seeing it for a few seconds, they all screamed and fled inside. It was normal height and wearing a one-piece suit with a goldfish bowl on the head. There was a glass visor, a ridged tube like an elephant trunk, and a box on the chest into which this led. Around the face end of the tube were lumps. The right arm was held stiffly, and the other held the box. Mrs. M woke her son, who lived opposite. He tried to film the area with his camera, but the flash failed to work, even when new batteries were put in. The figure was not seen again after the first brief encounter. The police were called and arrived laughing at 2.35 a.m., but soon changed when they saw the fear of the women. They searched the area, but found nothing, and left at dawn. Since then, the women have seen assorted lights in the sky in the area. They also checked fire, police, and council offices, but could not find a suit like the one worn. A neighbor suggested that they might have seen a workman spraying rat poison, but the council said that they would not do so at that time. The suit is, in fact, very like those worn by exterminators. It has to be so to avoid the toxicity. The sucking noise occurs, too, to transfer the poison from the chest box up the tube. One suggestion that may be worthy of note is this. A local off-duty exterminator, fed up of the woman chattering away until two in the morning, may have donned his suit and gone out intent on scaring them off. And who can blame him? Now, I personally think that that would be a pretty elaborate way to try and get your neighbors to keep quiet. A simple request to keep the noise down probably would have been sufficient, but who knows, it's possible. So, upon a simple googling, I couldn't find, like, an 80s-style exterminator suit, so I'm not sure if this description actually does fit the appearance of an extermination or pest control suit at the time. I did find pictures of ones that kind of resemble hazmat suits, just a, a one-piece kind of vinyl material with a hood, and I, but I didn't see any with the box on the chest or, like, a scuba goldfish bowl kind of top, just like a hazmat mask that put the two canisters on it. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. Uh, but it does match the description, the classic description of UFOs, right? All right, so moving on to the next report. This one is quite extensive. There were several instances that took place over several months in 1982. And Nufan themselves were actually pretty skeptical of this account, but I thought it was interesting, so I wanted to include it anyway. This account arrived anonymously from a correspondent, clearly a young man with a panache for reading comic books and a regular subscriber to The Unexplained, the post address was County Tyrone, and from the account, it is evident he also lives near the border. He did not leave an address, and so his story stands or falls by the information he passed on through his letter. But this was very detailed and included several sketches. Here, for what it's worth, is his story. The first instance is from February 4th, 1982. After watching the movie Halloween on TV, he fell asleep easily, but awoke to hear a strange noise, something like a saw, and noted the bedroom was different, slightly distorted, a feeling which is a typical first stage of an out-of-body experience. Deciding he was dreaming, he fell back asleep, but reawoke a while later and saw a shadowy figure in the corner of his bedroom. As he tried to rise to view it, he found he was paralyzed, but with effort, he pressed himself up, terrified, and saw a male figure, dark, small, without a neck, and yet with long hair. This came towards him and turned sideways, exposing two large faceted eyes, which widened and closed and had a black keyhole pupil. It made a breathing sound like a cat purring. One hand was pointed towards him, and as the being moved this away, the paralysis began to fade. The entity blended into the wall and vanished. At this, the room brightened and became normal. He recovered the use of his limbs in a few minutes and found the time was 7.55 p.m. The second occurrence took place on April 10th, 1982. At 11.45, he decided to attend midnight mass. It was a clear, starry night. Looking at the sky, he saw a planet, and above that, a series of flashing red, white, and yellow lights. Below these was a large, but faint, red light silhouetted against, which was the outline of two humanoids, one large and one small. 
The object appeared to be rotating and moved across the sky in a jerky path, taking five minutes to vanish. At the base was a large egg shape. There was no sound, and he is positive this was a spaceship. A few days later, he saw it again on top of a mountain. Below was a large red patch, in front of which a giant humanoid passed. It was so far away. To be seen, the figure must have been gigantic. The final occurrence reported took place on April 20th, 1982, and he claims this was the most scary. He says he awoke between 3 and 5 a.m. to a silent scream that was very loud, but not there. There were two aliens this time, a small one that stood on his bed and a big lumpy one that had his head in the witness's mouth, which had somehow grown very large. They were chatting to one another in a sound like ringing bells. He tried to talk, but no words came out and he was paralyzed again. Pointing to his dressing table, he thought the word camera over and over, but the obviously shy alien shook his head. The witness apologizes for not taking a picture. The witness does not seem to know how this last encounter ended. These events sound rather like dreams or hypnagogic hallucination, but needed mentioning in view of their UFO context. He adds, quote, Normally, I'd put these down to a dream, but after what happened to me, I believe these things really happened. In fact, I know they did. End quote. So, yes, please use your discernment. And like the investigators at Newfon said, they have their doubts as to believing these stories. They are very intricate, very strange, possibly very creative. Definitely some high strangeness if they did occur. But I found it to be interesting, so I did want to include it. But with that, we will move on to the next encounter. The witness is now aged 62 and a former nursing officer. We shall call her Mrs. McDee. She lives in Higher Bebbington. It begins in 1926, when, aged six, she would often see a bright, round light outside her bedroom window, which she took to be the moon. On one particular night, it appeared and beamed a ray through the window onto the wall, where it formed a round patch of light. Suddenly, silhouetted within this light, appeared the figure of a gnome. It smiled at her, and she did not feel afraid, although interestingly, she says she was afraid of her father, who was seemingly very strict with her and her brothers and sisters. The gnome now proceeded to dance, gently at first, and then vigorously. After some moments of this, she did become alarmed and cried out, A boogeyman is in my room. The moon vanished from by her window, as did the beam and the gnome, before her father arrived, who, of course, told her she had imagined it. However, some minutes later, she felt the bedclothes being tugged and yelled out again. When her father arrived and switched on the light, he found the clothes in a tight roll at the foot of the bed. She was moved to another room, and although the moon came again, the gnome never did. Although even now, Mrs. McDee believes she will meet the little man again under much more harrowing circumstances. This experience left its mark in the form of a total fear of garden gnomes. Indeed, she came to regard these ornaments as being cursed, and when her mother purchased some, she begged that she throw them away. Her mother refused such silliness and allegedly became victim number one of the curse, dying at just 39 within a few months. Her sister-in-law was the next to obtain gnomes. She also dismissed the curse and had both legs amputated shortly after, age 40. Then her neighbor became the final person so far to decide to put gnomes in her garden. Her husband was rushed to the hospital for a serious operation, but she did not part with the gnomes even then, until she became ill and the gnomes were consigned to the bin. Mrs. McDee adds that she no longer mentions them because, quote, I feel the bad luck may come from me taking note of them, end quote. As with many other witnesses to such strange phenomenon, whatever their origin, these childhood events were just the start. Nowadays, she is plagued particularly by a sound, a sort of constant pulsating, that fills the air outside of her present flat almost every night after midnight. There appears to be no environmental source for this, and others do not hear it. The humadras, as it is called elsewhere, is a well-known experience to which she seems unfamiliar. Mrs. McDee has also seen many UFOs, as large football-shaped white objects that float outside her window. It hovers around for 15 minutes and then silently climbs the wall into the sky. She first saw this in 1980 whilst at the hospital she worked at, but it has reappeared several times by her flat. 
Evaluating this case is difficult. Clearly, there is a strong subjective element about these experiences, and this is emphasized by her most recent report to me. On April 15th, 1983, around midnight, she reported a brilliant white star that was there most nights watching her. Although she claims this suddenly began to rove like an aircraft and flew away, it was without question Venus she was watching. She may have seen an aircraft as well, as planes were being diverted from Manchester due to a strike. Her area was, therefore, unusually active late at night so far as lights were concerned. Her ready willingness to ascribe supernatural origins to natural events has to detract from the credibility of her account. But the Dancing Gnome is an intriguing bedroom visitor case from the days before UFOs and may show what a close encounter of the fourth kind was like in the pre-extraterrestrial hypothesis world of 1926. So from my understanding of these closing statements here, um, that the dancing gnome may showcase what a close encounter of the fourth kind was like in the pre-extraterrestrial hypothesis world, is that so-called UFOs, or quote-unquote UFOs, now they're called UAPs, you know, the language changes and is developed over time. And in 1926, they really didn't have this terminology and catalog for UFO experiences. And people like Jacques Vallée think that fairy sightings and experiences or gnomes, these may be what are now considered UFO experiences, Gnome sightings, fairy sightings, are a precursor to what people now consider a UFO or a UAP sighting. Why that is, is of course up for debate. Whether this is the subconscious kind of projection of the experience, maybe the individual is using their pre-gathered knowledge of folklore to kind of project this image onto what they are seeing, or is the intelligent being using the known context of folklore to manifest themselves, or is this the true appearance of whatever being they're seeing, and are fairies and gnomes and UFOs and aliens, are they all the same thing? It's hard to say, right? And it all varies based on individuals' experiences as well. As for this sound that she was plagued with uh, later in life, the constant pulsing that fills the air outside of her flat almost every night after midnight, um, the, in this report, they use the term humadras, and I don't even know if I'm saying that right because I'm new to this word, I don't know, but it's spelled H-U-M-M-A-D-R-U-Z. So that's just my guess. Hamadras, Hamadrus, that's what it looks like to me. I was not familiar with this term, but apparently it is a term that is related to strange phenomenon and um, a definition for it from Robert McFarlane is a noise in the air that you can't identify or a sound in the landscape whose source is unlocatable. And that does sound exactly like what this witness experienced, Mrs. McDee. She couldn't find an environmental source. Other people didn't hear it. So I, I haven't read up much more on Hamadras, um, but that's very interesting. And also really, really uh, troubling if it's something you experience, right? Few things are as mm, plaguing as sounds and unlocatable sounds and constant sounds. Think about people who suffer from tinnitus, so it's just a very troubling and frustrating thing to experience, I'm sure. Um, poor Mrs. McDee really sound like she's been going through it for a long time with a variety of different phenomenon. So for now, let's move on to the next report. 1983. Several years ago, Mrs. A was inspired to produce a painting of a being who visited her. However, it was not until a few years later that she began to produce regular paintings of spiritual beings or guides. After completing a few of these, she considered them to look unusual and came to believe that she was painting space beings and space gods. She apparently became interested in the celestial nature of her oil paintings when she, quote, began to have space dreams. These dreams are where I see spacecrafts and beings sometimes watch or take part, and I write it all down in the morning, end quote. They wear unusual headdresses and richly colored garments and have different colored eyes and faces. The male beings often appear to wear earrings and beards. Some strange lettering appeared on their garments, and she now produces a lot of alien writing, which fills more than 52 pages of her notebooks. She has no idea what it means, but hopes someone in the future will be able to translate it. 
She believes the originators of these messages to be real people and sees them often, both in dream state and awake. In one dream, she saw a UFO come down, seen by all people on Earth. The aliens wanted to help put the world to right. They wore suits with a kind of weapon and chased those who failed to accept them. She takes this to mean they will one day come in surprise. Wow, I would love to see this artwork that Mrs. A is producing of these alien beings or space gods. And the alien writing sounds really, really interesting too. I wonder what that looks like. So she also had the common dream or message that the aliens want to help put the world right. Could be an ecological message, perhaps it's a political message or both. But again, there's two sides to it. There's the want to help, but then there's the uh, threat of violence on the other side. A very interesting encounter. And now we'll move on to the next one. John Casey is a 68-year-old Irishman, now living in Leeds. He related his only close encounter from the days of his youth. At the time, it was not regarded as a sighting of a UFO, but a meeting with the Shi Gui, or wind spirits. The date was May 25th, 1925, and John was 10. He lived in a very remote village in County Cork, Southern Ireland. There was no electricity and, of course, no aircraft or motor cars. When night came along, everything went pitch dark. It had been a warm day and was now almost completely dark when he went to bring back a bucket of water from the well. As he walked along a track, he suddenly saw a large oval disappear and move in his direction. He stopped, and it came right overhead. In size, it was as half as big as the full moon, and its color was golden yellow, glowing from the center. It pulsed as it hovered, and then moved off in a straight line over the house before suddenly curving to the left and vanishing in a flash. The day had been warm and the evening hazy, which suggests that this might have been an encounter with an atmospheric, unexplained anomalous phenomena akin to ball lightning. John further recalls that his parents and grandparents, and even great-grandparents, had passed along stories of their encounters with the lights going back into the 18th century. The descriptions, white or blue, are usually yellow or red lights that suddenly burst into life, floated along, and then vanished sound rather like marsh gas, this being an area of peat bogs. Even so, this is a fascinating reminder that UFO-like events are nothing new, only our interpretation of them. Now, I must say, I am partial to stories about fairies. <laughs> That's one of my favorite topics. So, naturally, I love this encounter. They mention the Shi Gui, which is the Irish word for fairy winds. And I know these to be a gust of wind or even a whirlwind type of phenomenon where perhaps you're working in the fields and the corn or whatever you are working on or cutting will be kind of swept up in this whirlwind. And to see that kind of thing, of course, um, seems otherworldly. And many people would think that it is the presence of fairies working alongside you, perhaps taking their share of the harvest. And it's advised not to look directly at the fairy wind, as you could come down with a, some sort of illness or bad luck, or maybe even be taken yourself. So I find it interesting then that in the story they call it the Shi Gui, the fairy winds, but he doesn't really mention any wind. He mentions seeing an oval, um, kind of a moon-sized oval that was golden yellow and glowing and pulsing with light that then shot off across the sky. And that sounds very much to me, you know, like a modern uh, UFO sighting. And later his family members mention seeing these kind of lights going all the way back to the 18th century, which is very interesting. But I thought it kind of sounded more like maybe like a will-o'-the-wisp kind of thing. A colored, bobbing, or pulsing light, which would um, be something that you would see definitely out at night and could potentially lead you astray. Of course, a natural explanation for this phenomenon is, like they said, marsh gas which can create bioluminescence as gases are being released from swamps or bogs at night. I'm not discrediting anyone's experience. And of course, I find it very, very fascinating. And now we will move on to the next story. The witness is a 39-year-old factory worker 
We shall call him Alan. After his sighting, he struggled to find someone to believe him. His wife thought him mad. His mates dismissed his tale, as did the local paper. Eventually, he found Jenny Randall's address and wrote to her. Here is his story. January 27th, 1983, 9, 10 p.m. On a clear, cold night, Alan was walking north along the banks of the disused Essington Canal. This runs parallel with a motorway. His intention was to walk to visit a friend, and the time is thus only approximate based on his departure time from home in Small Heath. The distance was more than two miles, hence the shortcut along the decayed and litter-scattered canal. But Alan is very fit and able to cope with this. Suddenly, he was attracted to an object in the sky almost directly above him, and thus above a row of electricity pylons that lined the canal. It was like a large, thin mirror that reflected light brightly, but was brightest in the center. It was surrounded by a haze. The mirror was unlike a star or aircraft, and larger than jumbo jets he claims to have seen on the flight path into Birmingham Airport. After just five seconds, it went out. Slightly puzzled, he continued to walk onwards, down the towpath, and moments later, just a few yards further on, he saw two beings on the grass to his right and in front of him. There they stood looking at him. He approached them curiously. Both were male, about five foot six inches tall, with dark curly hair and high cheekbones, a light complexion, and blue eyes. They wore one-piece suits of light gray material, tight-fitting and with a motif above the heart that he cannot recall. They were both identical and perfectly proportioned with athletic bodies. He was able to make out such detail in a dark, lonely spot because they were surrounded by a glowing aura, like sodium lighting. After a conversation with him that lasted a few moments, they turned and glided away. This they did with feet off the ground, like ice skaters, apparently suffering no impotence from the rough grass. After going back into the undergrowth for some yards, they vanished. Alan was left stunned as to why they should confront him, an uneducated man, in such a lonely spot. He saw no point in it. The conversation was spoken in English of an educated level. It was spoken in a mechanical, robot-like fashion through a perpetually open mouth that did not move. Both spoke in unison. They asked him to go away with them on a journey, but he said he did not want to leave his wife. They told him he would see her again, but still he refused. Then they promised to reward him. But again, he said no. Bracing himself for restraining action or force, he was pleased but surprised to see them depart. Alan returned home stunned, but received no support from his wife or those he tried to explain the events to. He slept badly, suffering nightmares, and got sleeping tablets from the doctor without explaining why. He also lost 14 pounds in weight. His dreams of colorful planets and robed beings on thrones are regarded by Newfound investigators as post-encounter anxieties due to his inability to get anyone to listen. But, more interestingly, although hardly astonishingly, Alan has a long history of psychic experiences, including many ghost observations. From childhood, he says he always had a feeling that one day he would be abducted. Yet, he remains skeptical of many UFO claims, and he has tried to rationalize his own encounter by returning to the scene looking for reflections from the motorway. In conclusion, we have an archetypal psychic contactee witness who undergoes a typically pointless close encounter of the fourth kind experience. One can find possible answers that fit some of the facts. There were aircraft in the surrounding area at the time, and shift workers from local factories might have been around in work clothes. But in view of other reported details so consistent with other fourth kind cases, this seems an extreme answer. One may consider that this is an uneducated, unemployed man afraid for the future of his family. Could he be said to be undergoing a life crisis that might have allowed ordinary stimuli to trigger a strange encounter that has given new purpose to his life? Whatever the truth, this is a classic case in the mold of so many others. Ugh, oh, poor Alan. It's really tough to be uh, a contactee or someone who witnesses any kind of anomalous phenomenon, right? Especially in modern times. It's just dismissed, frowned upon, questioned. But in no way does it dispel the anxiety or anything of the experience that was had. I find these beings that he encountered to be very spooky, identical, talking very eloquently, but with their mouth open that doesn't move and they're both talking at the same time, echoing each other. 
and they're glowing. And then they glide away, hovering above the ground like they're ice skating. I would have liked to have heard some of his ghost encounters from when he was younger, but very, very interesting stuff. Mrs. W. wrote to me from a Panin mill town. The events which she has now painfully unraveled are, to say the least, fantastic, but she insists they are true. The story begins in December 1969, when she lived in Birmingham with her first husband. She was barely out of her teens and qualifying with a degree as a teacher. Her husband told her one night that they were going on a journey. She had to prepare for a shock, and it was some kind of test. From his voice, she knew it was not a joke. They got into their car and drove off, but details of the trip are hazy. They then arrived at a house, which was dimly lit. Some people were standing around a long table or bed, and she was laid upon it. A weird medical examination then began, using strange equipment she only vaguely recalls. A strong sense of shock overlaid the experience, and her mind was, quote, interfered with. There was a tall, thin man in the party, with a long nose and white beard. He had heavy eyebrows and actually told her, Remember the eyebrows, honey. Later, one of the group said to her, almost as an aside and in a wry tone, They will think it's flying saucers. Her next memory is of being told by her husband that they were going north, but she does not recall how this happened. Images flashed into her mind that included the present house she now lives in and other unfamiliar houses in Hebden Bridge and Bradford. It was all very dark as this occurred. As they stood in the last house, her husband clicked his fingers and she found herself back in the room in Birmingham on the bed from where the journey had begun. She had no recollection of the ensuing time lapse. He then explained to her who he really was. He was human, but she will not elaborate. To prove that he possessed full knowledge of the future, he told her political matters then secret, which would later be demonstrated. He then told her how her life would unfold, explaining in detail many events that would occur. However, he told her that this information would be in her mind and would only be retrieved at the relevant future point. He gave her mnemonics to help recover this information when she began to sense the time was right. He then told her to forget everything, which she immediately did. The next day, her first husband left her and said he was going abroad. She has never seen or heard from him since. Eventually, in about 1978, memories began to come back, triggered by incidents in her life. She was by now remarried and realized that back in 1963, she had been shown her future husband and all about their life together. As mnemonics came to her, she was able to recall things before they happened and tell others to prove these predictions. They were all fulfilled, and she thinks that there are no more major ones to come out, except perhaps the houses she saw. But she cannot be sure, as memories of the abduction are still unclear. Quite what to make of all this is hard to say. The parallels with UFO abductions are obvious. There is little doubt Mrs. H believes it. Indeed, she is certain that she was taken into the future with the aid of future technology and given her life plan that was then put into her subconscious to guide her. What an incredible story. That's honestly pretty unlike anything I've ever heard. I have heard of other instances where houses seem to be the place of abductions and medical examinations and things like that, and so maybe they're actually some sort of craft or alien ship is what is thought after, and they're somehow cloaked or transformed to look like a regular house. You know, I myself did once have a dream of a house that I would visit in the future. I had this dream when I was really young, I'm not sure what age I was, but all the dream was was just kind of you know, a subjective view, just like I was looking out of my eyes. I couldn't see myself. There was no other people. And I was just walking through this house, starting at the front door and weaving through the entire house, going up the stairs, going through all the rooms and taking in different objects. One object that I still remember is a rocking horse. Not a wooden one, one of those plastic ones uh, that was on the metal frame and had the springs. I remember that. Anyway, so I had that dream, and then years later, my mom started dating someone who would, she would later marry. And when I visited his house for the first time, I immediately remembered my dream because it was the exact same house. I saw the rocking horse. It was the same layout. It was very, very strange and very visceral. Anyway, let's now move on.
February 28th, 1981, 1 a.m. This is certainly not a typical UFO event. Indeed, it may not even be a UFO event, for there is no UFO, and the entity, whilst quite bizarre, is not typical either. But as it fails to fit into any other category, such as a ghost, this seems the only place to record it. It certainly has many consistencies with UFO events. Three men, in their 20s and 30s, were on a midnight poaching trip for rabbits in an old and long-abandoned, rather derelict POW camp in a side lane off of the A41, a Roman road, if that is relevant. There was a gusty wind. It was overcast and raining. The figure was first seen by one of the men, George, who pointed him out to the others. Whilst it was taken for another poacher, it was odd that he was dressed so inappropriately. He seemed to wear a bright, white, three-quarter-length Macintosh, which is hardly the best way to hide in the undergrowth. Suddenly, the man began to glow very brightly, and as the area was dark, with no moon and no nearby lighting, this somewhat perturbed the watching young men. The figure now began to pulsate or throb in different colors. The head was red, the eyes a kind of laser red, and the rest a mass of luminous green and yellow. The eyes allegedly did not look solid, but more like a wobbling jellyfish. What was more, the figure seemed to be floating about three feet off the ground and bobbing up and down like a cork in a bottle. Malcolm, who was gripping George's arm with fear, saw it start to bob in their direction and decided that that was enough for him. He dropped all his nets and tackle and fled in a blind panic through the pitch dark across a freshly plowed field towards the car. Ivan, the third man, saw that the figure was now tilting at a 45 degree angle, seemingly inspecting the rabbit warrens. Summoning up courage, he told his friend he was going to get closer. He expected George to follow, but he did not. George admits he was completely terrified and rooted to the spot. The hair on his neck stood on end, and though he wanted to go with Ivan, he was quite unable to move. Meanwhile, Ivan had reached a boulder about 20 feet from the Warrens and squatted, partially hidden. The figure was now bobbing towards him. Ivan, bravely or foolishly, stood up to confront it. Apart from being three feet off the ground, it was of normal height. It seemed to him to be intelligent, aware of what he was doing, but remaining silent. He tried to get it against the skyline to see if it was solid, but as he rose and bent down again, it copied his movements. It then began to pulsate faster. Ivan looked around for George at this point and found he was not there. In fear, he picked up some stones from the ground and threw them at the thing. He does not know if he hit it, but it stopped. And then it just seemed to fade and blend into the background, like a projected slide being switched off. It had been in view for ten minutes. They ran back to the car to join Malcolm and went straight home. George woke his wife and she attests to how horror-stricken he was. The incident was not reported to the media or police. The witnesses admit they felt most unlike trying to convince anyone this really had happened. Isn't that a unique sighting? Can't say I've heard anything like that before, and I understand why Nufon had a hard time categorizing this entity. Hard to say if it's a UFO or a ghost, but definitely fascinating to hear about, right? I've got some more stories with some odd little creatures coming up, so let's move on. Winter 1937, 8 p.m., Rotherham, South York. Not a UFO case, but an interesting entity observation. The witness was walking his dog along a dark lane by a pit hill when he saw a strange figure running very fast down the steep slope. The dog at this point ignored it, but the figure ran straight at a fence which barred the way. Instead of stopping to climb over it, it ran right through it, as if it were not there. Passing within touching distance of the witness, it was observed as humanoid, around 5 foot 2 inches in height covered in hair and with goat-like hands and feet. The head was oddly pointed. Without ceasing its mad dash, the figure crossed the road and up a steep bank towards the Sheffield railway line. The witness's dog at this point turned and went home. Although he had a strange compulsion to follow the creature, he did not do so. Upon arrival home, his mother commented, You look as if you've seen the devil. I have, the witness replied. What a creepy little creature that was. They said in this report that the entity had goat-like hands and feet. I'm 
I'm guessing this means cloven hooves. I'm not sure what else they could mean. So that makes me think it sounds like a goat man. There was a point recently where I obsessively read up on every Goatman legend I could find, and I actually did make a video about it, so check that out if you want to hear all the Goatman stories that I could dig up. And there could be plenty more little Goatmen running around out there. Keep your eyes open. Although, when it's said at the end that he had a strange compulsion to follow the creature, that sounds fairy-like to me. Sounds like he was almost being lured in to be pixie-led. And it's probably best that he wasn't. Mrs. G describes herself as a professional astrologer, and she has led a very odd life. She reports all manner of bizarre experiences, some with her husband. These include seeing many apparitions of the living and seeing, quote, a most distinctive man dressed in a red tracksuit, tall and dark, and looking rather like the old pictures of the devil without horns. She's also had what she calls time warps whilst walking along the streets in Swiss Cottage, London. And perhaps strangest of all, quote, I once had the odd experience of standing up and feeling there were two of me and not sure which was the real me. Don't panic, I told myself. This is a valuable experience. But I did panic and snapped together to my relief and was whole again. In late 1985, in the Royal Free Hospital, Hampstead, she saw the death flash, like a reverse lightning bolt. This shot into the sky moments before a man came into the day room to announce that a friend of hers had just died. A few days later, whilst watching Ian Botham on TV, his face suddenly changed into that of her deceased friend, who was smiling happily. But what has all this got to do with UFOs, you may ask? This stems from May 1972, when on a coach tour through the Soviet Union in Poland, during the middle of the night, she was passing near Posen in Poland. She says, quote, Everyone was asleep, except for the driver and myself. There was a companion coach directly ahead, which I could see very clearly. Then I saw a group of gremlins on the roof of the bus. They were the size of a child of seven or eight years old, but very human in appearance, yet obviously not human. They were not quite solid, yet not transparent. They climbed up the coach and romped about on the top. They seemed to be fully aware of the humans sleeping inside and were gleeful at being able to move freely unobserved. I seemed to feel their contempt for two solid humans who are dense to them and stupid, slow and lacking in vision. I told myself I must be hallucinating, but continued to see them for quite a long time. They were not of the same time space, physical dimension. First of all, love a professional astrologer and a woman who leads an odd life. I like the idea of the devil walking around in a red tracksuit with his little tail poking out of the pants, maybe dangling out of a pant leg. In the middle, they mentioned a death flash, which they said was like a reverse lightning bolt. I couldn't find anything on this. I'm not sure if this is a personal term of theirs or something established, but I never heard of it and couldn't come up with anything in a search. But of course, the star sighting of this report are the gremlins dancing and playing on the top of a bus. <laughs> Pretty cute. I love a gremlin sighting, a goblin sighting. If you do too, I have two videos dedicated to first-hand encounters with goblins and gremlins. All right, let's move on to our next story. Mr. W was aged 22 when this experience occurred in May 1943. He was working at a military base northeast of Norwich. The investigator found him still active and with a lively mind, and although Philip's excellent report shows that he tends to ramble, he clearly recalls the strange events well. Mr. W had missed the last train and so was walking back to the base through the village of Catfield towards Ludham. Suddenly, he saw a green glow which, as he approached, turned out to be a normal-looking man wearing something like a diver's helmet. He was stood by the road, and the green cast came from a box on his chest. The only odd feature was a perpetual, almost sickly, grin. In the field beside the man was a gray bell tent about 12 feet high. Two other men were standing near this, although it was not possible to see them too well. Mr. W. rushed past quite frightened and learned when he reached his barracks that another man had seen something in the area, but Mr. W. did not obtain details. He was due on early morning duty soon after and did not report the matter. However, for two weeks, Mr. W. was too frightened to walk that same road. A 
short sighting there, but a strange one. This entity he saw was wearing the usual UFO attire, a diver's helmet, box on the chest, but this grin is creepy. I'd run for my life too, and probably never return to that same road. All right, so I'm going to read the final experience for the night, but it's spread out over three different reports. As I was picking through these new find journals, I was able to find three different reports of this same story. So I'll go in chronological order as they reported it, and it's a good one. July 16th, 1981, 2.15 a.m. Three young women, ages 25 and 26, are involved. One is married, two are separated, and all three live in Telford, Newtown. On the day in question, they had been to a disco in Shrewsbury, consuming only Coca-Cola, and were returning home in a lively, conversational mood. However, some moments before the sighting, this mood altered and conversation ceased. They cannot explain this and find it odd. The object was first sighted to their left, above a field, in wide open country. It seemed to be about 200 feet up and consisted of four white lights in a ring with two red lights inside this. These were clearly seen to be connected to a disc-shaped object, which was tilted so as to reveal its underside to the women as they drove past. There was no other adjacent traffic, and all three immediately recognized that they were observing a UFO. At the interview, they remarked how they felt so ridiculous with an apparently impossible flying saucer suddenly in plain view as if it were the most natural thing in the world. They took half a minute or so to drive past, and slight discrepancies occurred, in that the girl in the back, who had the best view, said it moved upwards into low cloud after they had passed. She claims to have seen a row of windows on the side. The other girls only say that the lights noticeably dimmed as they passed by. They were all frightened, and the driver attempted to accelerate away, but the car engine seemed to lack power. They all describe a most odd sensation, saying that it seemed to take ages to reach Telford, only four or five miles away. They drove straight to the police station, where their report was logged. The experience was timed accurately by a watch in their car at 2.15, but by that watch, they arrived at the police station at 2.55. The police logged their report at 2.40. By either estimate, there is an appreciable time discrepancy which baffles all three girls. On reconstructing the experiments, this time distortion could be as much as 25 minutes. Whether this was due to the alleged power drain or some other factor remains to be ascertained, hence the consideration of hypnosis. It has to be said, for what it's worth, that all three girls seem psychic and suggestible with an extensive track record of visionary experiences. The girl who had the best view is apparently very susceptible to trance states, had a UFO sighting when she was a child, and claims she has always had the feeling that she would be contacted in one day. Next report. In recent communications with Malaysian researcher Ahmed Janaludin, we've been considering the problem of whether contact may occur in some cases where this is not immediately obvious. For example, the repressed memories emergent under hypnosis. I have recently been speculating that contact may actually occur far more often than we realize at a subconscious level. Ahmed suggests that we check for symptoms and where these show up subject the witness to hypnotic regression. He points to physical marks on the body and punctures on the skin, nightmares within a few days of the experience, unexpected sudden manifestation of psychological symptoms, for example, fear of bright light, apparent time discrepancies in the story under consideration, and other sightings in the area. As an example, we recently reported on a Shropshire case investigated by Stephen Banks from July 1981. Three women in a car observed a low-level UFO and then suffered time distortion and disorientation as they drove the few miles home to Telford. The three women have been brought to Manchester and subjected to medical regression. One could not be regressed by either of two doctors, independently. The other two were regressed to the incident and both recalled an alleged contact experience. The two stories were recounted completely independently, screened from one another. There were some comparisons, but far more differences. Rosemary finds herself separated from the others, floating out of the car. She is in a room with a central table and light pouring out of the walls from no visible source. 
Both of these are remarkably common close encounters of the fourth kind motifs. She is forced to get onto the table in a series of four-foot-tall robots, gray, round, rolling on wheels. They're friendly and look at her, but do nothing. She sees the car on the road below and floats in. Vivian sees herself staying in the car as the other two girls get out. She feels a floating sensation and is sucked up inside a mist, car and all, inside the object. Here she finds herself in a room with a central reclining chair or table, and a male voice repeating slowly and incessantly in her mind, Don't be afraid. A group of four-foot-tall entities then appear. Ugly, green cloaks, hairless, thin arms. She is scanned by a big light and hurt physically, with the voice still repeating its phrase. She says, quote, They're pulling at my bones. It seems as if they're inside my legs. She is then carried back to the car. Work on this fascinating case is to continue. All right, I will now read the final report on this case. Regression hypnosis revealed a dramatic tale of an encounter three young women had in July of 1981 while returning from a night out in Telford, Shropshire. This case includes time loss. All three women were hypnotized, although in one case it took three sessions and two different psychiatrists to achieve this. Vivian and Rosemary were easily regressed, but were unable to remember events they described under hypnosis, except that they had a belief in having been abducted. The session reference in detail here is the one on the third girl, Valerie. Val tells how the three of them were wishing something exciting would happen, and how they suddenly stopped talking to one another, immediately prior to Vivian seeing lights in an adjacent field. This was consciously remembered as unusual. They all looked and saw a domed object with a row of windows across the middle, hovering above the field. This description is given in very similar terms by all three girls. Val, however, recalls under hypnosis she saw the UFO as a light in the sky before Vivian spotted it in the field. For some reason, she had determined not to say so. When Val calls out, it's coming toward us, her fear notably mounts. The doctor constantly monitors blood pressure and pulse, which proves this. The UFO glides. We are now past the point of conscious recall, and Val throws her hands up to her face and cries, the lights are hurting my eyes, I feel funny. She goes lightheaded and dizzy, feels a painful light inside her head, and is paralyzed. Vivian is still with her in the car, but Rosemary has vanished. These facts are again verified in the other sessions. I don't know what's happened, Val calls out and realizes the car is stationary with the doors open. She decides to get out and try to find Rosemary. Outside, all is black. The UFO is not visible. I can feel it's here, but I can't see it, Val says. The bright light comes again, giving great pain to her head as she staggers off trying to find her friend. Vivian stays in the car. After a moment or two, Val gets too frightened and turns to go back, but something touches her on her shoulder, and then she feels as if someone is carrying her. A slow and gruff male voice speaks, Don't be afraid. It is slow. Under hypnosis, Val gives an amazing rendition of this deep voice, quite unlike her normal speaking tone. Valerie then says, I feel as if I'm being sucked up. And, with the voice repeating itself several times, she finds herself in a triangular room with no furniture and all alone. She is there a long time and wants her friends desperately. Under hypnosis, she is asked if it is happening or if she thinks she's imagining it. I feel as though it's really happening, she says. A male and female entity come into the room, but every time Val tries to recall them, she feels a pain in her head. She knows they are six feet tall, with dark shoulder-length hair and blue eyes, with whitish skin and a green cloak on. They ignore her and seem more interested in her clothing. The female entity takes off Val's shoes and tries to walk in them. Val is told that the aliens want to examine them, quote, to see what we are like. Vivian was selected at random from the three of them to be medically examined. Rosemary was simply to be observed, to see how she responded. The sessions on these two, conducted immediately after each other without possibility of collusion, both concur in these key respects. As to who the aliens are, Val was told, you are not to know, and then you would not understand. The session ended with her belief that there was a memory of some events still missing and that it was gynecological in nature. We could get no more. What is interesting are not merely the many comparisons with other abduction cases, but also the unusual level of agreement between three witnesses independently hypnotized. Could a fantasy be so interlocked? 
All right, there you have it. A pretty interesting and uh, harrowing report. I do find abduction stories to be very fascinating, and I know that they are extremely troubling and even traumatic to those who actually have had the experience, so I don't intend to sound insensitive, Uh, I just find them extremely interesting. And I'm particularly interested in encounters that happen in cars. I don't know why. I even have a whole video dedicated to stories that happen while driving on lonely roads at night. There's just something about this setting that's very eerie to me. And if you're alone, then it's a good place for you to enter a trance-like state, driving on a dark road, no traffic, you can kind of slip into that autopilot where you might be more susceptible to some kind of supernatural event, but this was a group of people and they were lively and talking, so it's not likely that they were in that trance kind of susceptive state. As for the hypnosis, the regression hypnosis though, I don't know how I feel about hypnosis or regression therapy personally. I've never had the experience, so I can't speak from that. But it's been kind of tainted by unethical practitioners, right? It's much less that I question the witness, and more that I'm wary of the therapist. But all in all, very, very interesting report, as were all of these. That concludes tonight's UFO Story Hour. I hope you enjoyed these extraterrestrial tales of otherworldly encounters. Thank you for tuning in to KGOB Goblin Radio. I'm your host, Goblin Queen, and until next time.